Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello and welcome to the Neil Before Pod interview segment. I'm your host Craig and I recently had the pleasure of chatting to actor Sean Doyle, known for The Expanse, Star Trek Discovery and many, many other things. We discussed the frustrations of the post-COVID audition process, marvelling at intricate set design and learning how to be a chess master. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. So I'm delighted to be joined on Neil Before Pod with Sean Doyle, actor who was in The Expanse, Star Trek Discovery, and a bunch of stuff we'll also talk about. Hi, Sean. Welcome on. Nice to be here with you. Thanks. No problem. How are you doing today? How are things over in Toronto, is it? Is that where you are? I'm doing great. I don't live in Toronto. I live about two hours outside on a lake called nice. Pigeon Lake in the Kawartha Lakes area. It's very beautiful and sunny here today. The snow is finally melting and uh, all is good in our world. We're starting to see a bit of sun here. I'm in Scotland and when the sun shines, it tends to be rare. So we like it when we get it. Everyone's out. Why are you inside today? You could have told me you wanted to delay this and get outside. It's a sunny day. It's evening time and the sun's going down. So we're all good. Oh, right. It's six there. I forgot. (laughs) Yeah, the day is over. Right. Let's just start with a bit of how you got started. So how did you get started in your acting career? What got you your beginning and Mm. what interested you in that profession? Well, I grew up in northern Canada in uh, Newfoundland, or what's actually called Newfoundland and Labrador. And I grew up in the Labrador portion of that, which is on the mainland and tiny little mining town called Wabush. And in spite of the fact that it really was just a small little place with a bunch of miners, my father was part of a local community theater group. So I kind of grew up around it. My dad would always take me to his rehearsals, which were always in a gymnasium. As a kid, I just remember hanging out and playing on the mats while he rehearsed and whatnot. It was just always part of my life. And when I got into high school, I got involved in it myself, doing stuff in high school plays, etc. And then I went to university, not really knowing what I was going to do. And the first year I was at Carleton University in Ottawa. I ended up being part of two plays from the whatever, Sock and Buskin, I think was the name of the theater company at Carleton. I did two plays with them. And then after that, I was pretty convinced that that's what I was supposed to do. And so from there, I auditioned for one theater school, which was really silly of me to just put all my eggs into one basket. But thankfully, they let me come in. And that was York University in uh, Toronto. And I moved to Toronto. And that's where I lived for a long time and started my acting career. And you've done a wide variety of stuff. Your IMDb page takes quite a lot of scrolls to get to the bottom of. That just means I'm old, man. (laughs) That's one word. It's not the word I would necessarily use. Do you have a preference in genre of stuff to do or type of character that you like to play maybe? Or is it the variety that attracts you to doing all these types of work? Yeah, I'd say it's the variety. For me, genre can be fun, but it always comes back to whatever the human dynamics are of a character and their relationships with the other characters. That's really what draws me to it. And I think the reason I got into it in the first place was because it was such a form of expression. I was kind of a loner growing up. I was shy. I was overweight. I didn't have a lot of friends. And so for me, that was kind of an easy way, an easy hack to express myself. And so that's still, I think, what subconsciously I'm looking for when I'm looking at pieces, as opposed to being attracted to a certain type of genre or what have you, just looking at the character and what I can convey through that. Just try and dip your toe into every kind of thing that you can get your hands on and experience it. Yeah. And also, it's pretty great to be an actor and live kind of vicariously through your characters. And I've had experiences where I've gone to New York and hung out with the head of the major crime squad there in preparation for a film I did. And I've been trained multiple times by various soldiers of different units for various war films I've done. And I'm actually potentially doing a film coming up. And it's a therapist. So the idea of actually diving into that and figuring out what that world's like and what a day in the life of a therapist would be like and how their mind works, that's what's really exciting to me. And I noticed on your IMDb page that you did a couple episodes of Rain, which is a bit of a period piece. Did you enjoy going back in time and dressing the part, getting into costume? And I know it's a bit of a heightened reality they have on that show, but at the same time, it is still back in those days. Yeah, that was fun. That was very brief. That was only a couple episodes I did. The best part of that job, if I remember it, was the sets. I was in at the beginning of that in the first couple episodes, and they had all these brand new sets, like interiors of castles and that sort of thing on soundstage. And it was just so impressive. The work that those people can do, those craftspeople, creating these so real looking sets made of styrofoam and plastic and whatnot. And you'd think you were in any castle in Europe, it's just phenomenal. So that sense of make-believe is always fun every now and then when you step onto a new set or for theater for that matter too, you step onto the stage for the first time 
and see what they've designed. That's always a moment full of wonder. And then you can actually pretend. And so Rain was that for sure. And I noticed Vegas on your list as well, working with actors yes. like Dennis Quaid, Michael Chiklis, Carrie Ann Moss, people like that. What was it like being around those big guns, I suppose, in TV and film? Well, it was interesting because my first big break by Hollywood standards would be a film called Frequency I did. That was with Dennis Quaid. And I played the bad guy in that. That was a long time ago. And I showed up on Vegas and he kind of said, we worked together before because I didn't want to let on. I didn't want to say, hey, man, do you remember me? And I told him and he was surprised because it had been such a long time and it was such a different circumstance. It's hard when you see people out of context. That was an amazing show. And I'm really disappointed because I would have been part of that had it continued. But I think the reality is that it was a really expensive show for CBS and they just really didn't want to spend that kind of money. Talk about pretend. The sets were phenomenal. It's a period piece set in Las Vegas in the 60s. The cars that they would have all the time, the wardrobe, they wouldn't build any new suits. It was all real. It was all stuff they had found. Yeah, that was beautiful. And they're just fantastic actors, obviously. And I spent most of the time acting with Carrie Ann. I was kind of her uh, presumed future love interest on the show. Yeah, I loved it. That was one of my favorite experiences. And I was just so sad when we didn't go another season. It was a good show. It's one of those, yeah. like you say, probably too expensive to live. But if you just look at the actor salaries, I imagine that probably kept the budget high. The actor salaries for sure. But when you do period pieces, everything costs so much money. You got to think about the rentals of all the vehicles and the costumes and whatnot. Also, when you work with people of that quality, it's just easy. There's no acting. You're just actually being in scenes with people relating, talking just the way you and I are right now. The thing that's the hardest for us to attain working at that level actually is the easiest when you get there because you're just working with everybody who's so damn good at what they do from the actors to the directors to the writers, everybody. It's what we all wish for. Yeah, absolutely. And another show I watched that I loved actually that you're in Bellevue. It's a really interesting little mystery show right. and the town is, it's an entity into itself. I think it's just this intricately layered little town that works on its own way and you were working a lot with Anna Pack when you was the lead so what was it like building that connection especially with your character's position almost in opposition to her as in she's mm -hmm. solving this mystery and all your guys are saying no there's no mystery here we're not taking this seriously at all yeah she's a pain in the neck she's one of those kind of detective savants right that have hunches and uh, instincts that the rest of us don't and my character understood that about her she was a pain in the ass to deal with but there was also a real, what the audience believes to be a kind of a father-daughter or older brother, younger sister relationship going on, which kind of gets turned on its head towards the end of the season. But yeah, it's about tolerating someone's idiosyncrasies to get to the goal that you know they have somewhere deep down, which that character always had. And again, acting with Anna was like acting with Carrie Ann Moss and Chickless and all those people, just so good that it just is easy and fun to do. And it must have been easy to immerse yourself in that little contained world that they built as well. Like I say, this little town that's just lives and breathes by itself almost. Yeah, well, I mean, that's credit to the creator, Jane Maggs, and the executive director, Adrian Mitchell, because we actually shot that all over Quebec. There was not one little town. There were pieces of it everywhere. But to have the vision to be able to scout for locations and come up with what you need, even though they're in disparate places geographically and somehow meld them all together so it actually feels like one environment, that's pretty impressive. And we came across some really wild places there. Like there was one abandoned asbestos mine, and we shot a bunch of stuff there, which is just so kind of haunting and creepy and really lent itself to the show. Yeah, but I love doing that show too. All that TV magic to disguise yeah, the yeah. seams. And when you did Endgame, are you a big chess player? Did you know a lot about chess before taking on the role? Or did you have to teach yourself to pass as a grandmaster? <laughs> yeah, I knew how to play chess. But every chess game in that show, and for anybody who doesn't know, and I'm sure there's a lot of you, Endgame is a series about a chess master who comes to Vancouver, Canada, for a championship and his fiance ends up getting gunned down outside the hotel that they're staying in. And as a result, he becomes plagued with various anxieties and panic attacks, agoraphobia and whatnot. And he can't leave the hotel. He's stuck in the hotel. And from there, he decides he's got to figure out a way to pay his money. So he becomes an amateur detective. So that's what the show's about. I had to work with a real chess master from that area. And every game that we played was basically a choreography. It was moves from famous games through the decades. This is the original board from the show, which they were kind enough to give me when the show wrapped. 
So I still play it here with my friends. For people that are listening, it's just behind him. It's a pretty cool looking chessboard. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's good. The pieces are here. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, it was interesting. So I had to learn them like choreography, especially because in a lot of the show, I'm doing speed chess, which is something, of course, a, a real chess master would never do. But to amuse himself, my character, Arkady Balagan, would play up to nine people at once. So I'd have to be walking from one board to another and taking the moves. And so that was as difficult to learn as the lines, <laughs> frankly. Maybe even more so. Make chess look interesting. Well, they did it with yeah. The Queen's Gambit on Netflix as well, I suppose. Love that show. A subgenre there, isn't it, of chess yeah. stuff? <laughs> yeah. Searching for Bobby Fischer still is one of my favorite movies. Beautiful movie. Chess is art, you know? Chess is like mathematics or music or anything. There's such a beauty to it, to the mental game and to the way the characters move and even to just the tactile sense of moving things around the board. I love it. Cool. Interesting. And talk about, about Ashgrove. I spoke to Jonas recently. That's how you ended up being on this yes. podcast because he reached out to you for me. Yeah, That was a really interesting movie. I watched it as part of the Glasgow Film Festival and the idea of this relationship breaking down while the world is ending around them, I, I thought it really interesting. He talked yeah. a lot about the little bubble you all existed in when filming it because mm-hmm. it was as soon as... COVID restrictions lifted enough to let you film it and you had this little bubble where you were filming in this farmhouse and, and staying in this hotel. So was it really good isolating experience in a way to be immersed with all those actors and characters as this tight-knit group of social group, I suppose? Yeah, it was a really weird and wild experience. I love Jonas. Jonas and I have known each other for a long time and we've worked together a number of times. And Jeremy Lalonde, his writing partner and director of the film, I've just been a fan of his forever, ever since his movie Sex After Kids, the first thing I saw of his. We've always wanted to work together. So I got this opportunity to go, and it was after a period of time when none of us had been working because of COVID, and it was the first thing that all of us had done again. So there was a real trepidation about giving out and working and being around people, and and of course, the fear of the virus was a lot stronger then than it has become as we've all gone on with our lives. We were sequestered in a hotel and we worked together in this little farmhouse. And just the surreal element of what was happening in the world made it a very special experience, kind of a novel thing. And beyond that, as you know, the film was, it was written with structure, but everything was created. I think I'm allowed to talk about this. I am, right? Have you had conversations about this? Yeah, I had a quite an open conversation with Jonas about it. It's screened, so I think it's all fair game. Okay, good. <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, so basically the film is entirely improvised. There's a structure that we followed, and it was just a grand experiment. We went in with our hearts open, and we all knew a lot more than Amanda did about what was happening. And she just jumped in like a trooper, headfirst, full of courage. And so we were able to kind of guide the narrative based on what Jeremy was telling us the scene would be about. And then what they ended up doing with it later was just fantastic, how they really was a great retelling of the story that we all had in our minds. But it was really scary. You show up and you're told it's going to be a certain type of experience, which is very different than we mostly ever get to do. I think the combination of that with the environment we were living in at that time just made it a one-off. Even if the same group got together and went back and tried to do another film with the same improvisational structure, it would never be the same because there were just so many things up in the air. There were so many uncertainties and fears and whatnot, but it was very special. And I just love all those people. And we're actually getting together this week. Oh, nice. Looking forward to seeing everybody again. Yeah. Jonas said that it was almost a happy accident that the film was the way it is because it was always supposed to be like that. It just so happened to be the perfect COVID filming situation because it was small group and contained location and all that. So it's good that... (laughs) <laughs> that happened, I suppose. It's good that that was able to happen. Yeah, it was a happy accident. I think there are many happy accidents that happen every day too, which kind of makes the film special. And have you done a lot of under COVID regulation shooting since things reopened? What's been your experience of various sets getting back to set? Is it very different? It's very different. Very, very, very different. And it's very different from set to set because I've been on very big budget things like Star Trek and Clarice both CBS Paramount productions with multi-million dollar budget and the protocols are crazy stringent. There's zones that you have to be in and there's just such a protocol that you have to follow, including testing three times a week. It's like another job inside a job. 
just to keep up with all that. And, you know, there were many times on those sets where people did get COVID and then the production would have to shut down for a period of time because those were the protocols. So my experience was ranging from that to doing low budget stuff, like this little indie I shot with them, which we tried to be as safe as we could, but we also bubbled and sequestered ourselves. But then I did another small indie in Northern Ontario, which is in Canada, where I live now, where the protocols were not nearly as stringent as the bigger budget things because they just couldn't afford it. That was late 2020. So we tested maybe three times, once at the beginning, once in the middle, and once at the end. And it almost was just to pay lip service to that kind of thing because that's not really going to accomplish anything testing. It's just a moment in time. But fortunately, nobody got sick. We did wear masks and that sort of thing, of course. But when you're shooting a film, it doesn't matter if it's a low budget or a multi-million dollar project, this idea of staying away from each other, six feet away from each other and whatnot, even between cast and crew, it's virtually impossible. There's just too much going on. Too many people have too many things to do. You can't observe all those protocols stringently because nothing would ever get done. But yeah, it's a very different environment for sure. And I think we're all looking forward to the time when that goes away. Although I'm sure that some things will never go away. I'm sure the various protocols that have come into place about eating and that sort of thing, for example, I bet you that's here to stay. Yeah, I've spoken to a number of actors that talked about the difference in the catering situation. There's no more shared bowls of nuts or whatever that you can just dip your hand into. and That's right. No shared dining, that kind of thing. Well, I suppose that will come back. Yeah, maybe the shared dining will come back. But I think like the individual servings, no longer these craft tables you're talking about where everybody can take from the same bowls and whatnot. The problem with that, of course, is that it takes the pressure off these companies to be environmentally friendly. So all of a sudden you've got plastic back and styrofoam containers and individual styrofoam containers and straws and all those things that we've worked so hard to try to eradicate from the business. So I hope we can keep pressure on various production companies to try to keep going in the right direction with that stuff. And some actors have talked about the changes in the auditioning process, how it's pretty much all taped now. You tape yourself, send it off. Ugh. Not a fan, no. <laughs> it's so bad, dude. It's so <laughs> bad. I think the biggest challenge right now, and I was on our union's council, so I just actually came through the last round of negotiations. And one of the big focuses was this, the auditions. Because what it basically means is that we do all the work now. We do all the work that even the casting people would do before. And we have to do it in a vacuum, ostensibly. So we continually get these auditions. We put them on tape. We try to get a reader if we can. Very often, I have to have someone on Zoom the way you and I are right now, reading lines to me, which is not acting. It's an entirely different thing when you're trying to be in front of the camera and connect with the person in a little square. And then you send off the auditions. But the problem is that because it's so easy now to disseminate these auditions to everybody, I feel what's happening is that the casting people are getting too many people to audition for a role. So they can't even watch them. And I'm sure you've heard all this before, but what's happening is that we feel as if nothing is being seen. So you spend all the time doing an audition and it takes a lot of time, you know, to prepare for an audition. It's not just about learning lines. You've got to set all the equipment up. You've got to prepare the scenes. You've got to do them. You've got to edit it. You've got to send it off. And you don't even know that it's being looked at because rarely do you get feedback unless you get the job or you get a call back or something like that. So it's really bleak in that respect for us right now. And there's just a different energy. When you're in a room with someone, your electrons are connecting. You're physically bouncing off each other. There's a real chemistry thing happening. And when you're doing it that way, it's not. There's a whole element of what we do that's just been thrown away, hopefully just temporarily. I, for one, will be happy to be back in person with people and doing it that way. And it'd be so easy to get in your own head during that kind of process as well, because you know you can record it again and watch it back or whatever. Whereas if you're in the room, once you've done it, you've done it. And you know that you yeah. give it your best and then it's over. You can't take it back. It's something interesting about that because I'm a Virgo and <laughs> I'll do 20 takes sometimes. Maybe I'm, but that's exaggerating. But <laughs> I'll do a lot of takes until I feel like I have something that's quote unquote perfect or put together properly. But when then I go back to look at them, so then it takes me a shit ton of time to go through all the takes I've taken. And I would say nine times out of 10, I'll use one of the first two takes that I did because it's just way more spontaneous and it's more real. And that's what I miss about being in the room. Even though you don't have the opportunity maybe to do it a bunch of times, you only get one shot, maybe two. There's an energy that comes with it where you're kind of jumping off a cliff that you don't have with the rest of the takes when you're trying to make it right. Perfectionism can be the worst. 
Yeah. And for an actor, it's death, right? The idea is to not be right. The idea is to try to fail as grandly as possible. That's when the real stuff happens and you take risks. Hopefully they'll get back to the in-person, in-the-room type thing before long. Yeah. It I sounds so. better, for sure. Certainly from my perspective of never having to do it. But it sounds better to just be in there, get it over and done with, and then move yeah. on. And also then you know that they've seen you, for good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone has actually looked at it, which is comforting in itself. Mm. Yeah. That's right. So onto your big sci-fi appearances. The Expanse being the first one, you had the prominent role over a couple of seasons. Mm. Three or four seasons, I believe. Yeah, you were there for quite a while. And he's definitively a villain. There's kind of no two ways about that. But do you think he genuinely believed in what he was doing? Or did he have some other agenda that he was driving at in the background? It's the, the politician thing, isn't it? They're always up to something, or certainly the bad ones are. Yeah, I would say that, yes, he entirely believed in what he was doing. I think he was doing everything he could to protect Earth. And then I believe it got out of his control. And he found himself with a massive shit sandwich that he just really had no, no idea <laughs> how to handle. And as things got more desperate, his moves became more desperate and, quote unquote, evil as he tried to right the ship. That's my take on it. What was it like getting in that mindset of someone just so driven, so obsessed, so committed to what he was trying to do? I think we all can find that, don't you? Yeah, I suppose we wouldn't like to admit it, wouldn't we? But it's there. Yeah, ambition. I think we all have various levels of ambition. And if you just think of what that is for yourself, and then you just fill it with helium, and it gets bigger mm. inside you. Speaking about myself, not you, of course. <laughs> And then it's there. The thing is, when you're on a show like that and the writing is so good, you just have to follow the writing. And if the writing is good like that, then you just identify with it however you do as a person. You don't have to place yourself in some imaginary thing. You can find something in your own life or you can just say the bloody words and try to relate to the people you're acting with and it's all there. And then what you perceive from it is, I'm not saying anything you don't understand, but whatever you get from it, it probably has nothing to do with what we were doing on the day which is what's magic about what we do, I think. And The Expanse is a future that could happen, really. There's a lot of steep right. in realism, so it, it might be a bit easier yeah. to gel with that world because you can recognise our own world in it in a lot of ways. Yeah, goodness knows we're so precariously close to a lot of bad things right now on our planet. And so that show was just transported a few years down the road. But yeah, I think it's very easy to relate to what was happening and what that world was like. But I'm actually not. I know that you are and a lot of your listeners, huge sci-fi fans. I'm not a sci-fi fan per se, with the exception of Battlestar Galactica, which I love, love that show so much. Because the idea of world building is really fascinating at first blush to me, but it doesn't sustain me through doing the role or doing the show. And I work with other actors, particularly on Star Trek and Expanse to a certain degree, where they were just so into the science and that world. And if they didn't have enough stimulus in the characters they were playing, they could look around about their characters in the context of that world. And they loved it. They got a rush out of that. It was a bit different for me. For me, it's always just about what the character wants from other people, what he's trying to do, and if he's failing or succeeding at it. And then that coupled with me just trying to express whatever I trying to express to the character. So for Star Trek, you weren't a fan of the franchise as such. It was more or less just kind of a job. No, no, no. I wasn't a fan of the show per se in terms of having watched all the shows before doing it. I consequently watched all the seasons and really appreciated the show for what it was and fell in love with a lot of the characters and was really excited to be there and do it. I don't want it to get misconstrued that I wasn't a fan of the show. By the time I started that show, I really was. But again, for me, that character and that show, it was really about trying to redeem a mistake from the past and get back to what I considered love. That for me was the entire show. And again, I'm from Newfoundland and a phrase we use there is the ass falls out of something, right? The arse falls out of it. And so in that show, the arse fell out of a lot of things for my character and he desperately was trying to keep the ship in the same direction again, literally and figuratively. But yeah, it was really about trying to find a way back to that, find a way to redemption. For sure. And then the thing about Tarka is the pinch points of his character must be really easy to latch onto. He's motivated by things like loss. He's consumed by this obsession that he has to get back to Oros. And it's all just easy to understand stuff. So all the other weird science fiction stuff and all the technobabble and all the science 
stuff in the background is incidental really it's just window dressing because that's what he's about it's about these things we all experience about these things that we all deal with yeah that's completely true and again there are some actors who really thrive on all that scientific stuff and all the details and they're very good at it i mean i showed up the first day and my first scene was with anthony rapp and doug jones in the engineering room i think when we were creating a wormhole and all of a sudden i'm doing all this stuff in the air and i just kept saying to people does it feel like <laughs> i'm being specific and i'm doing stuff they're like don't worry it'll be great it'll look great <laughs> So then you kind of have to go, okay, I guess I'm like a five-year-old again, going beep, 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 and kind of giving over to that pretend. But the quality of the show and the design of the show and all the people who do all that stuff, first of all, once I saw the show, I understood how we are supported and what we do with what they're doing. I mean, it's phenomenal. And all throughout it, whenever we had to say there was a scenario of Discovery facing off with Bookship in later episodes, we were shown storyboards, really detailed storyboards about what things would look like. So we had a really strong idea of what the visuals would be, just enough to get the imagination flowing or the 10C, for example, all of that. It's just such attention to detail that they do on that show. It's impressive. And talk about walking on the sets and just being blown away. I do have to admit that when I stepped onto the deck, I think my final day of the first episode, I did the scene, which was my opening scene in the show, where I come onto the Discovery for the first time and walking onto the flight deck and looking around at the captain's chair and the big window that right now is looking at a green screen, but you know what's going to be there in the show. That blew me away. That made me feel like a kid watching Star Trek again, original stuff. That was cool. Had you had a lot of experience with green screen filming before that, or was it something relatively new to you? No, I've had a fair amount of it over the years. I've never done anything that's primarily green screen. There's a lot of those films that are so animated. I've never been a part of something like that. I wouldn't know what that experience was like. But again, I think you just got to break it down to what that character as a human being is trying to do in that moment and allow the rest of it to work its way out. It must have been pretty surreal being near Doug Jones where he's in the stilts and the big makeup and you have to scream in his face, which is something you do in your first episode. Yeah, I screamed in his face and we were blocking the scene, just in case some of your listeners don't know. When you show up on set, you block a scene where you figure out where you're going to move, as you say, various lines and do various bits of business. And then you rehearse the scene until every camera knows what it's doing and we know what we're doing and then we shoot the scene. So in the blocking, we're not even at the rehearsal level yet. I just had an impulse to scream that moment at him just to kind of see if I could get a real reaction from him and for myself and everything. And I almost blew my voice. And then I ended up having to scream for the entire rest of the day. And I almost blew my voice on that first scream. And I just was like, Doyle, you're such an idiot. Why did you do that? He's amazing. First of all, and I know that you've heard this, I'm sure, a billion times, but he's the sweetest, most thoughtful and generous of spirit person that I've met on set goes out of his way to make everybody feel so welcome there. And it sounds hyperbolic, but it's really magical what he does with that prosthetic on his face. When you're in person with him and you see it for the first time, you go, oh, there's a tall, skinny guy with a thing on his head. But then when you start to act with him, it comes alive. It's the weirdest experience because it's not as if it becomes really mobile and moves the way a, a face would move. It doesn't really. But for some reason, just his energy and his eyes and the mouth moves, obviously, and physically what he does energetically, there's no difference between relating to him or a person with no prosthetics or anything on on the other side of me. It's really something. What an extraordinary gift that guy has as a performer. And he's done that time and again with so many films. The physicality on Saru is great. The way he waves yeah. his arms when he walks and things. Those yeah. little yeah. character details that he's woven in. But he's the king of prosthetics, isn't he? He's done it so many times. I asked him this, and I doubt I'm talking out of school by saying it, but I said, how do you do this every day going into... Because he has to go like hours and hours every day. And he said, well, for me, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough to do. But the people who watch appreciate it so much that it just makes it worthwhile for me to do. They appreciate the show. They appreciate the character. And so that's all we can ask for is that people appreciate what we do and get something from it. And I can see a number of guitars in your background. Did you discuss music with Anthony Rapp? I know he's very musical. No, I didn't discuss it with him, but a little bit. We hadn't met each other before, so we've talked a bit about our backgrounds. I know he comes from the New York theater scene and is still very involved there with musical theater as well. Of course, he did Rent, right? 
Yes. He was in the original cast. Another great guy, very welcoming. Those two guys really made my first few days, my landing very soft, and I'm forever grateful to them for that. Yes, certainly that first episode must have felt a bit like a play because you were mostly in the one set just talking about yeah. various things and mostly talking about the DMA, but still it was about just throwing emotion around the room at each other. Stamets being standoffish with you because he thought you were arrogant and then he comes around to, well, he knows what he's talking about, but he's kind of arrogant still. So there's that respect there, but that almost begrudging respect. Yeah. It was a great tense exchange, all that, even though it was essentially plot furthering stuff. It was... Very involving, I thought. Yeah, it's always fun to play those kind of scenes because as actors, you're allowed to be competitive and try to one-up each other in subtle ways. You know, you can be a bit of an asshole. I'm talking about being the character and being (laughs) a bit of an asshole, right? That's kind of your job there. It's fun to play that stuff and see how it's taken and how Anthony would react and whatnot. And he's a very good actor. So, you know, when you work with really good actors, you just toss something in a certain way and they hear it. They recognize what you're trying to do and they can take it in and then toss something back to you that's equally as sharp. And then you're like, oh, okay, we're playing tennis or something here. It's <laughs> the most fun. And what was doing the debate episode like? Because I know that was that multi-layered set. I don't know how stitched together it all was, but debating the, what do we do about this thing? And you're saying, let's blow it up. And other people are saying, let's try the diplomatic solution right was everybody there at the time or was it all stitched together yeah everybody was there there were basically two levels to the set and i know in the show it's multiple layers and levels all the principal cast were there and a ton of background people which made it really challenging because again because of the covid protocols there's a whole procedure of bringing the background people into the set to make sure they're unmasked and then bringing in the principal characters and same thing getting in and out and between takes, everybody has to mask up again. So that was all really challenging. For me, I had a lot of scary days on this show because I would have long, long monologues and some of them quite technical. So trying to find a way to make that interesting and specific and A, memorize it, which is challenging with that kind of techno speak, but then to try to make it kind of move and have some kind of fluidity and dynamics and stuff, that's challenging. But that was fun because Ultimately, it was like holding court. And then imagining that you're holding court to everybody around this circle and everybody down there and everybody below that and below that. And that was interesting. It was fun. Those sets are just, they're unbelievable to see in person. You should try to lobby to get over to see it, to have a (laughs) set visit. Really, you should. I would love to. It'd be my dream to walk around a real Star Trek starship. That would be incredible. Well, I'm sure you've made enough connections now that you can get somebody on your side to do something. (laughs) Let's hope so, yeah. Most of your scenes were with David Ayala, if that's how you pronounce his name. I've never actually heard it spoken. It's Ajala. Ajala, okay. I will correct that from now on. Most of them were with him, and it was a really interesting relationship. They bonded over how similar they were and what they were going through, but I like that Book wasn't willing to cross lines that you were willing to cross. That must have been really fun to bounce off each other and develop that and spend all that time in... Well, his bridge, his command center and his own ship. Yeah, my brother. I love that guy. We had a great time working together. You never know, right? It's always a crapshoot. The creators of the show knew that we were going to be together for the entire season. And I kind of knew. I didn't know towards the end what was going to happen, but I was kind of given a generalized outline of where we were going to go with it. I don't know that David knew. And so when we showed up, the first scene was me meeting him in a bar and kind of teasing him with some information I have that might seduce him. It it brings up his own stuff, right? His own sense of grief and and anger. And we didn't know each other. We kind of talked a little bit between takes and got to know each other a bit. But that's always exciting when you don't know someone and you have to go in and start going, okay, let's see what this actor's like. And that seems pretty subtle when you look at it back. But there was so much going on between us, and it was different every take. And I went, okay, we're going to have a good time on the show together. And we did. And we had a really good time. He was really supportive in helping me play the world of the show. And we were just really there for each other emotionally when when both of us had emotional stuff to do. We always were 100% there for each other and and also 100% encouraging and appreciative of each other's work and really vocal about all that. It was a dream. Again, when you work with the good people, it's easy. And what about the cat? Did you spend much time with the cat? I was working with the animal. I'm allergic to cats. (laughs) So I was quite happy not to have anything to do with the cat. (laughs) Although she was in a couple of scenes that you were in, but I suppose across the room. That's right, across the room, a safe distance. (laughs) One of the things I found really interesting about Tarka was, especially towards the end, when he just totally lost sight of 
why he was doing it or he always had his mind and his objective but kind of lost sight of the connective tissue around it whether Mm. succeeding would be in any way beneficial it was completely lost it was all focused on i need to do this thing and then everything will be okay yeah there was a point where he just expressed that he just didn't care what happened after he succeeded yeah earth will be destroyed whatever you'll figure it out do you think he ever cared about the collateral damage or was he just playing everybody to try and get what he wanted regardless of what the outcome for other people was as i played it he genuinely had rationalized himself into believing that it really wasn't going to be that much damage. I really feel like he didn't do it with the intent of hurting other people, obviously. He, he didn't do it with the awareness that this was definitely going to cause the collateral damage that it would have. I think that he really convinced himself that what he was doing was the only way and that there would be ultimately very little damage. And the things that had to happen had to happen. And this was the right thing to do for everybody and everyone. I think that's the only way you can play that stuff because otherwise the mustache starts twirling and I hear the word antagonist about him all the time. Well, that's not my job to say whether he's an antagonist or not. My job is to help him get what he really wants to get, which is back to the only love he's had in his life. I would say he's antagonistic, not full-on antagonist. Yeah. The reasons he's doing what he's doing can be understood, but it doesn't justify what he's doing in a way, and then corrupting book, playing the devil on the shoulder, that must have been fun, just trying yes. to say, come on, come with me, do this. I did like the idea that, like a chess master, he's always so many moves ahead that he understands how he can play book. He understands the right things to drop, and he's anticipating book's reactions, and therefore always able to be a step ahead. But again, it's always weird to me after I play a role and people start tweeting at me that, oh, I want to punch you in the face, you're such an asshole. I'm like... <laughs> talking about man the guy was in love and something happened to him and for me that's all i see right that's all i see when i play it the rest of it is again whatever we do how you perceive it is how you perceive it as my mother used to say it's nobody's business what people think of you no it's actually i'm sorry i got that wrong it's the other way around it's none of my business what other people think. so yeah it's, it's just always surreal to me when i play and for me i'm way more interested in playing morally opaque characters. You just don't know where they stand because we're all like that. As human beings, we're so complicated. We're not black or white. We're in a gray area. And sometimes we verge into either primary color. And so that's the most interesting place for an actor or a character to be. So yeah, I try to give my characters as much empathy as possible. And it's always weird when people seem to label it so simplistically, which is fine. That's how the character's being presented to them, but that's certainly not what I think when I'm doing it. (laughs) I love the complexity, especially in the flashback episode where you got to see that completely different side of him, that tenderness, that compassion that was nothing we'd ever seen before with him. And it was obviously this profound experience. And I don't know what the reading of it was in the script or through direction, but the reading of the Oros relationship to me was deliberately ambiguous. It was the suggestion of perhaps a romantic connection, but it was undoubtedly a strong connection. But I don't think it ever, certainly what comes on screen never really strays into either way. It's just to make it clear this is profound and strong and has an impact on both of them that leads Tarka to do what he does. Mm-hmm. Well, a couple of things to that. First of all, knowing that that episode was coming up really allowed me to go in different directions before that, because I knew that that would bring the audience back on point to who he is, why he is the way he is. But secondly, we made a strong decision about what the relationship was when we did it. And it's interesting to me that people wonder what it is, that it's still ambiguous what that relationship was. And I won't say what we thought because that's not important, but it's interesting to me that, again, what we do on set and how it's perceived out there is always so different, having to do with how it's edited and what takes they use and in the context of the rest of the show. The particulars almost don't matter because it is just to convey this is strong and this is something that's worth giving up everything for, making this big leap and trying to almost give in to this hopeless dream. That's right. Of As soon as I get to this place, it will all be fine when there's no actual evidence of that. <laughs> there's no evidence whatsoever yeah. that even yeah. the place exists. <laughs> yeah, so that was interesting. And then his conclusion is a bit ambiguous as well, as in he says, yeah, maybe I'll get there with this energy that's going to hit the ship maybe i won't i don't know but i'm going to try it anyway it's almost the only way he can go because he can't go back from what he's done he can't just go back and say sorry at that point it's too late isn't it for everyone yeah i watched the recent james bond film 
two nights ago. Surprisingly good film. I really thought it was beautiful. So emotional. And the ending of that film, it's the same thing. There's an inevitability that the characters just have to give over to. Like you said, there's no way to go back. There's no way to fix things. I think at that moment, when he finally breaks in that final scene, just before everything falls apart and book gets transported. I think he finally understands what he's done, where they are, and and he knows that there's only one thing to do. So whether he believes he's going to make it or not, I played it like I really hoped, but I think the primary action for me in that scene is to save book. Yeah, and he has that line about, it was in the episode before that, but he has that line about, I've gotten close to two people and you're one of them. And you really believe that. I think the writing, the directing, the two of you did a great job in making that relationship build and making it believable, especially when it was over a relatively small number of episodes, really. There was a lot of time, but not many episodes. Yeah, I think there was seven episodes. I was in eight total for the season. Well, I met Book at the end of that first episode, but then our time together, it grew slowly over the rest of the episodes, yeah. Yeah, great stuff. I think Tarka was a really fresh take on an antagonist, especially in Star Trek as well, because he's antagonistic. He's not a pure villain. It's just, he's an obstacle. He's in the way. He's there to yeah. throw a spanner in the works. It's that's right. ruin the potential for peaceful first contact. He's the one that's stopping that from happening. So it's yeah, it's refreshing to see that level of complexity and, and stuff. And I imagine that must be great when you see it on the page as well. Oh, yeah. It's incredible what those writers have to achieve in terms of world building and writing relationships within the context of the world that they have to create, the science that they have to get over, and the plot that they have to get out. And so there's a fair amount of exposition in the show, but it's more or less easy to digest and palatable as an actor. And it's always within the context of the characters dynamic and the relationship. So it must be very challenging to be a writer on a sci-fi show like that and be able to meld all those elements together so successfully. I think they do a great job. And how did you keep a straight face with Tig Notaro on set as well? You spent quite a bit of time with her. I had so much time laughing at her between takes. Laughing with her, I should say, not at her. <laughs> that I got it all out before the take. The first stuff we did, the stuff with the wormhole, all that stuff that happened in the engineering room. It's the engineering room, right? That's what you call it? Yeah, the engine room, yeah. Engine room, thank you. Sorry, <laughs> everybody out there. Engineering room would be accepted, I think. It would only be maybe diehard nerds that would take exception, which isn't me. Well, I'm a diehard nerd, but <laughs> I'm quite flexible. I guess we'll see if I get any uh, tweets about it. <laughs> when we did those scenes, she wasn't there because she had a previous engagement. So we actually shot all that stuff with a not a body double, an actor who was doubling for her and shooting okay. behind her back. So we shot all of that first stuff without her. And then when she came into town to shoot the remainder of the season, they went back and shot her side, as they call it, of those scenes. So we were never in the same room together when we were shooting that. Oh, wow. That'll be something to look for when I rewatch it. And it's kind of what happened on, well, it's not exactly what happened in Army of the Dead, but she was spliced into That's right. existing footage. Well, that was for a very different reason, though. Yeah, it was a different reason. Won't go into. No, but she did talk about that, too, that she basically shot the entire film by herself. It was her and uh, Zack Snyder, right? Yeah. Zack Snyder and a tiny, tiny, tiny crew. And she shot the whole thing by herself, which is so bizarre. It's not acting. I mean, it's acting, but it's something else. I don't know what it is. It's like a tentacle of acting <laughs> to be able to do that <laughs> kind of stuff. I suppose as the technology improves and those things become easier to do, it's something that you have to keep adapting to, these different techniques that crop up. Where it's, Don't worry, we'll put other people in this later, or we'll yeah. put this backdrop in later, or anything like that. Yeah, and that's really challenging, because you still want to try to be emotionally honest about what you're doing. So there's just another layer and another layer and another layer of disbelief that we have to suspend. And I remember saying to Shoya Agdashla, who I did The Expanse with, I wrote a film, and I wrote kind of a cameo role a very crucial character to the film who had basically two very big scenes. And I said, would you ever consider coming and just doing a day, maybe two on a film that I wrote and I'll direct? It's a really good role. Would you ever do that for me? And she went, well, of course I would. She said, I just did Star Trek. And I just did one scene on that, but it took two weeks, two weeks to do one scene because it was all CGI. I saw the scene. I can't really remember the context of it, but it's basically just in an office. She's talking to Kirk right. about his job prospects. And that's basically it. And yeah. then she has another scene at the end where she follows up on that. And that's it. Yeah. Pretty mundane stuff, really, in terms of what's actually going on. And that took two weeks <laughs> to shoot that stuff. To me, that's just when the work 
kind of expands to fit the budget. It doesn't need to be that. Anyway, that's just my opinion. Was the scheduling on Star Trek in your experience much tighter than that? Or did you spend a long time doing episodes? No, relative to The Expanse, they were very similar. Relative to a film, TV is always faster, no matter the budget. There's just way more pages that have to be filmed. So on a film, clearly something like that Star Trek film, they're probably shooting anywhere from a quarter to a half a page a day. And on a big budget show like Star Trek, I can't quite remember now, but it's likely something like two to three pages, four, five, depending if there's a lot of dialogue and that sort of thing. And then if you're on a really low budget, or not really low, but just a smaller budget television show, like I did Endgame, we shot 12 pages a day on that. I was almost literally in every scene of that show. And I had so much dialogue in a Russian accent. And it got to the point where I couldn't even, after the first week, when I had tried to come home after a 12 or 13 hour day and memorize the 12 pages or nine to 12 pages for the next day, I realized I couldn't do it. So I just kind of had to trust that I'd be able to learn them as I went, which Somehow I ended up doing, but again, it's good writing. I think makes it easier. Yeah. And so what's coming up next for you? You mentioned your film that you wrote and that you'll be directing. When's that due? And then the, is there other projects that you can talk about? It's a very strange time in our industry right now. So it's not that things are shut down, but things are slowly starting to come back. So in terms of my film, I'm still trying to get money to make it. It's very challenging to find the money, but I hope to do it. And maybe someday I'll come back and talk to you about it. Maybe it'll be at the Glasgow Film Festival. We have a film festival in Edinburgh. I live in Edinburgh, so there's that too. Is that possible? Oh, you live in Edinburgh. I did a play by a Glasgow playwright once called Gagar and Way. I don't know if you've heard of that. I haven't, no. Great play. Gregory Burke is the playwright. Uh, in terms of work coming up, I just was asked to do a film, and I'm waiting to see if I'm going to do it. I have to read the script a couple of times and see if it feels right. I'm sure there'll be plenty of work coming your way. Um, there always seems to be some project around the corner. I hope so, man. Maybe we'll find out if Tarka survived and got where he needed to be. Maybe we won't. Who knows? I imagine the writers don't know. I'd be okay with him just finishing at that point. Sometimes you never need a question answered. That's usually what I think. Some mysteries are never meant to be solved. I will say that we have a real propensity in North America to try to answer all the questions, which takes a lot of magic out of things. Yeah. Definitely. So the last question I always ask is just a bit of a, an icebreaker at the end. If you could have any superpower, what would it be and why? Did you ever see the episode of Extras with Ricky Gervais when he goes to talk to Patrick Stewart? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was just showing my girlfriend that the other day. She says, well, I have a movie. And in my movie, I can see everything. I can do anything. <laughs> and I'm walking on the lawn and all of a sudden this police woman says, hey, you can't be on the lawn. And I look at her, and then all of a sudden her clothes fall off. <laughs> and I stay on the ground. <laughs> but that's not my superpower. That wouldn't be it. I would love to fly. I would love to fly, man. I haven't had one in many, many years, but I used to have to dream all the time about flying. And I'm sure that's symbolic of something, and I've never really looked it up. <laughs> wouldn't that be great to be able to just fly, to have the freedom to do that, to get away from all of this for periods of time? I'd like to fly. What would you do? Well, I'm afraid of heights, so flying wouldn't be much for me. I suppose if I could fly, I might not be afraid of heights. I'm afraid of heights, too. Oh, okay. But if you could fly, you would have no cause to be afraid of heights, I suppose. Exactly. Mine would be super speed. I still want to see things, but I want to do things and get places quickly so I can look at things as I'm running past them. Oh, like that. What was that? That was a character... Um... The, the new version of The Flash in the DC yeah. films. I thought they did a great job of elucidating what that would be like. Yeah. And then there's the TV show as well. They do some good speed effects on the, the TV show of The Flash as well. I've never seen that, but I'll check it out. It films near where you are, as does pretty much every CW show. Yeah. Vancouver is the home of the CW. Yeah. It's the home of everywhere. Apparently it's mm -hmm. Scotland and rain somehow. That's true. Cool. Great answer on the superpower. Lots of people like to fly. And as an actor, it'd be great as well, because you could get places without having to go to airports and things. Oh, that would be good, wouldn't it? I didn't even think of that. No international boundaries. Mind you, if I had the superpower of flying, I don't know that I'd be acting. I'd probably be doing other things. I'm not sure what, but don't you think that if you were able to do something of that scale that you'd want to then take the rest of your life up to that scale. You'd start Maybe. with saving yeah. kittens from trees and then you'd move <laughs> into, I don't know, delivering groceries to elderly people who couldn't get out. And then you'd want to start fighting forest fires. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. Or maybe I'd just still be as lazy as I am now, but just really fast. <laughs> Never know. <laughs> 
growing up. Thanks very much for coming on the podcast. It's been great chatting to you about your various roles and getting deeper insight into Tarka, who is a character that I really liked. He's a bit of an unconventional Star Trek character, mm. but a welcome one. Because it's good to see the franchise playing with that sort of thing and someone that just challenges the other characters who sometimes maybe don't get challenged by other characters in the way that they should. So it's, it's great just having that yeah. abrasive presence, I suppose, around them just to mm. keep them on their toes. That's always great. And that must have been a ton of fun, as you've said. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. So thanks very much for coming on and really do wish you all the best in the future. If you do want to come on after you get the money for your film and get to make it, I'd love to talk to you about your own film that you're writing and directing that would be a pleasure i'm happy to support you and getting the word out in any way possible thank you man appreciate that very much and it was a great talking to you hey thank you for your time okay man bye-bye thanks that was my chat with sean doyle we wish him all the best in his future projects if you enjoyed what you heard here then you can subscribe to us on spotify apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts please do leave us a rating and a comment. If you want to discuss this interview or anything else, then hit us up on Facebook or Twitter under Neil Before Blog or leave a comment on neilbeforeblog.co.uk. As always, we hope you'll join us next time on Neil Before Pod.